Folks, during the House Oversight Committee uh, hearing, Congresswoman Ayanna Presley sounded the alarm on the far-right manifesto Project 2025. Folks, of course, it is a 1,000-page manifesto that outlines a radical agenda to increase the powers of the executive branch if Donald Trump wins. Diminish rights for uh, protections for LGBTQ individuals, immigrants, women, people of color, and dismantling key government agencies. Project 2025's recommendations raise concerns about the potential erosion of civil liberties and the rule of law in the United States. Here's what she had to say. The federal government has the largest and most diverse workforce in the country in Schedule F, an executive order that would replace tens of thousands of civil servants with partisan sycophants, would destroy our government infrastructure, destroy it. It is critical that we understand that the far-right extremists who are advocating for Schedule F see it as a means to an end. It is their pathway to enact widespread wholesale policy violence. Uh, one thing I know for sure about uh, Trump and his sycophants is that um, they telegraph their harm. Uh, Mr. Shriver, are you familiar with Project 2025? Uh, Congresswoman, I've read about that. For many people, this is their first time hearing about it, and we must sound the alarm. Project 2025 is a far-right manifesto. It is a 1,000-page bucket list of extremist policies that would uproot every government agency and disrupt the lives of every person who calls this country home. I won't detail every aspect, but I'll share some highlights. The Department of Education would be eliminated cutting students off from civil rights protections and ending essential Title I funding for K through 12 schools. The Department of Justice would go on a murdering spree. It would rush to use the death penalty and expand its use to even more people while circumventing due process protections. Project 25 not only calls for national book bans in schools, but also creates a list of banned words for the federal government that would be deleted from, quote, every federal rule, agency regulation, contract, grant, and piece of legislation that exists. End quote. Here are just a few of the words on the list. Diversity, gender, reproductive health, and of course, conservatives want to ban the word abortion. On that note, abortion care would be inaccessible and illegal no matter where you live. Take it from them. On page six of its playbook, Project 2025 states, quote, the Dobbs decision is just the beginning, end quote. People, even in my district in Massachusetts 7th, a leader in repro justice would be criminalized for pursuing essential health care. Now, we could have an entire hearing on how these policies would quite literally ruin and end lives. And I didn't even touch upon proposals for housing, climate change, worker protections and more. If enacted, Project 25, 2025 would destroy the federal government as we know it. I ask unanimous consent to enter into the record an Associated Press article titled Conservative groups draw up plan to dismantle the U.S. government and to replace it with Trump's vision. Without objection to order. Now, some may be wondering why this is germane to today's hearing with the Office of Personnel Management. Mr. Shriver, do you know who the director of Project 2025 is? No, Congresswoman, I don't. The director is Paul Dans, former chief of staff of OPM under the Trump administration. And I am concerned about the ethics of Mr. Dan's leveraging non-public information or relationships forged during his government service to lead and advance this far-right extremist agenda. We need oversight and accountability of Project 2025. I don't think folks really are paying attention, Joe, when we talk about how lethal and how sick and demented Project 2025 is, especially if Trump wins. It's a serious problem. Um, you know, my mom worked for the federal government, the Department of Veterans and Affairs for 40 years. And I can imagine how someone in that position, in the position she was in or in a similar agency, could potentially, you know, you've got property right in your job, could potentially be taken away from you because you don't swear an oath of allegiance or someone feels like you're in glory, you know, whatever else, or somebody feels like you're the Department of Education and you shouldn't exist anymore. Um, you know, people really need to pay attention. This is where the urgency comes from for me. Anyone in this country who's dependent on the government at all for any financial help. Now, there's other things, but, you know, let's make it the most personal this way. Anybody that gets a government check needs to be extremely careful about what's going on here. 
um, and what is being planned uh, because they're basically going to eliminate all the safeguards, uh, all the rules, um, and effectively stay in charge even while being outnumbered. Um, and so, you know, I, I don't want to be less than sympathetic, you know, and ultimately, you know, I'm a faith person. Faith without works is dead, so we'll continue doing the work. But if somebody a year, two, three years from now who didn't vote or who voted the wrong way wow. has any complaint about anything in that playbook, it's a thousand page book. It exists. They're telling you what they're going to do. It's, it's like somebody that thought that they could tame a snake and a snake bites them. And they said, but I treated you good. And the snake says, but you knew I was a snake at the very beginning. So we better make our mind up and understand this is not about personalities. Maybe Biden isn't as 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 uh, uh, congenial or as exciting as as Barack Obama or Robert Kennedy. You know, maybe he's, uh, you know, long in the tooth. Uh, but there's a there's a very, very profound and stark choice um, that we have to make here. And only with one will the Constitution continue to, to exist on some level. As we know it, there will still be fights, but you'll at least have people at the top that want the Constitution to still be honored, et cetera, because out goes a lot of the things that we that we count on. Um, and so we better be careful um, and be aware they're not hiding where they're going with this. Yep. Go read the book. Yep. There is the book. Yeah, it's, it out. yeah, it's real clear. Uh, and listen, Randy, all these people were sitting there, oh my God, I can't believe Roe v. Wade was overturned. They kept telling you that. What the hell were you, were you not paying attention? They are not hiding. It's what they want. They told us what they're going to do. They've outlined the plan, like they said, a 1,000 page document. So if people don't know or try to act like they don't know, it's cognitive dissonance. They don't want to know. And, you know, I, of course, I haven't read the entire document, but the pieces I have read are scarier than anything Steven Spielberg ever wrote. They really want to completely change the government where we're looks like, going to look more like a dictatorship. It's, it's, it's terrifying. Yeah, and they are who they are, and they absolutely don't give a damn about the environment, Mustafa. <laughs> no, they don't. They want to get rid of the EPA just like they do with the Department of Education. You know, it's interesting. One, I really appreciate this show, Roland, uh, and, and Black Star Network. And here, here's some of the reasons why. So when I first found out about uh, Project 2025, I reached out to the a whole bunch of folks will know in the media world and said, hey, you should pay attention to this. And I got crickets. And then, of course, this show was one of the first to start talking about Project 2025 and that people should actually pay attention to it. You should read for yourself. And then you should ask the question, how will this benefit my community? And the question or the answer will be that it is not going to benefit your community. It's going to continue to roll back uh, many of the small wins that we have. Joe mentioned also about folks who check from the federal government, uh, how it will impact them. It's much broader than that. It is that. But it is also about all of the things that happen in your life are tied to one of those agencies or departments inside of the federal government, whether it is housing or transportation or food or jobs or, or civil rights. All of these things will be radically changed, radically weakened. Uh, that will have impacts inside of your life. It is also about that the federal government is one of the largest employers of people of color. So they're going to move many of these people out and bring in their own folks. And you saw how many people of color uh, actually worked underneath of the last uh, administration that, that Trump had. So there are all of these layers that you have to unpack. But the basic thing to remember is that if somebody is not moving forward with a plan that is going to help your life be better, that is going to better protect your community, that is going to strengthen our country, then why would we support it or the individuals who are moving forward? And of course, if you unpack it, it is right wing nationalists and racists who are the ones who put this plan together. So for black folks, the question would be, do you think that any of these right wing nationalists and racists have any, any indication that they ever want to do anything to help your community? And if the answer is no, why would you support them or this plan? Simple as that.
COVID happened, poor people were dying at a rate already of 800 people a day before COVID. If you went to a funeral every single day, it would take you 600 years to attend all the funerals of the people who will die from the ravages of policy violence, poverty, and low wages in America in just one year. It would take you two years and 19 days to go to all of the funerals of the people that will die today, and oftentimes, silence. Nobody talks about this political genocide, but we are determined today to remember their death and be a resurrection of voting power and voice power like never before. Economic justice and saving this democracy are deeply connected. We, as a nation, must listen to the demands of the poor who are pushing and will continue to push political candidates and elected leaders to lift from the bottom so that everybody can rise. We are the poor, the marginalized, and the underpaid. And we are taking one step forward to say that everybody has a right to live. Poverty is not the fault of those who are impoverished. It is caused by those who make the policy. There are over 135 million poor and low-wage, low-income people in this nation. The biggest block of potential voters by far is low-income, low-wage voters. I can't afford medicine. Sometimes I have to skip because of the cost. The farm worker community is tired of the violence imposed upon us by greed, exclusion, and denial of basic human rights. Those folk that represented by that casket, poor and low-wage workers who are the most moral people in this country because they go to work every day believing even though going to work is hazardous to their health. I'm tired of working 70 to 80 hours a week and still not have money for the necessity of bills. I'm tired of getting sick and not being able to go see the doctor. Having to make a choice to pay between rent or the light bill or food or clothes. You cannot claim to care about families and a culture of life and then do everything in your power to rob people of equal access to resources and to force them to live in poverty. Leadership of both parties that waged war on poor people and low-wage workers. And this government has treated people experiencing poverty, including their military families, with disdainful, deliberate, malicious neglect. So the truth is that my son died from poverty. We refuse to accept poverty as the fourth leading cause of death. The fourth leading cause of death in this, the richest country in the world. We march today for our children and the generations to come. And we need to do it with the loudest voices possible, the biggest actions possible. We will voice our demands and register our vote. When we stand up and when we stand together, things change. There is the electorate that is, and then there is the electorate that should be. 34 million eligible poor and low income voters did not vote in 2016. If just 20% of those voters in swing state were mobilized around an agenda, they could change the political outcome of every election. So we're launching the most massive voter mobilization and turnout campaign in history of poor and low wage voters, allies, and religious leaders. People are dying, but we know it doesn't have to be this way. And so we are calling on everyone to join us in this Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. We are here, we will be seen, we will be heard, and our power will be felt. We don't need to be an insurrection. We are a resurrection that will be felt across this country. Are you ready? 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 We are a resurrection, and we are ready. And